The Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Welcome to Deep Dive with the Institute for Justice. I'm Melanie Hildreth, and I'm here with IJ Senior Attorneys Paul Sherman and Bob McNamara. Big technology companies like Google and Facebook play an outsized role in the lives of many Americans. In recent months, these companies have acted, or in some cases, have failed to act in ways that have drawn criticism from the left and the right and have heightened the debate about what kind of regulation and oversight they require. On today's show, we're going to talk through some of the most common criticisms and weigh the consequences of various proposals. Paul, let's start with the concern that these companies are engaging in censorship. They unilaterally, sometimes mysteriously, delete content that they deem is appropriate. They delete posts and even whole accounts from platforms that people rely on to communicate information they feel is important. What are the free speech implications of their ability to do that? Sure. So in any discussion like this, it's important to distinguish between free speech principles, um, which may be very broadly held, and First Amendment law, which is constrained and deals with some very specific things. So as a general matter, the First Amendment is only a limitation on government action. It does not apply to private parties. So when someone like Twitter or Facebook makes an editorial decision about who they want to allow on their platform, that doesn't violate the First Amendment. Now, it may be inconsistent with broader libertarian notions of free speech. I think generally in a, uh, a pluralistic, tolerant society, we want to allow and tolerate a broad range of views on a number of issues, uh, even if we are not legally required to tolerate those views. So, Bob, did you have something to add? No, I, I just think that that's an important distinction. And sometimes, and you know, this this is a, an admission against interest, but sometimes in our debates about these issues, we tend to get a little too legalistic and a little too focused on lawyers and what lawyers think. And lawyers are tragically not the only people who matter in society. Uh, And I do think, you know, people who care about free speech tend to refer back to John Stuart Mill, who wrote the seminal defense of free speech. And Mill wasn't talking just about the government. You know, he was talking about society and how we ourselves should behave. And part of the justification for free speech is that we should listen to wrong views on the theory that they might be right. Uh, And it's, it's something I've always kind of struggled with because Mill himself, I think, is persuasive on that point. You know, he says uh, he, he says that if there's too much what he calls vituperation against people who are wrong, then people who hold wrong views will feel the need to be silenced and we won't have the benefit of hearing from them. And it, it just requires this interesting balance, I think, where right? Mill strikes me as correct. But the flip side of that is, you know, how long do I have to spend every day listening to people who tell me the moon landing was fake in order to kind of be a proper million liberal? Uh, and it's, it's something that I, I think it's worth acknowledging. It is hard and something that people have been struggling with for centuries. You want to be open minded. You want to be liberal minded. And also there are people you want to stop talking to you. So a lot of the the response from the lawyers who are familiar with First Amendment law is not just that, well, the First Amendment only applies to the government, but also that the companies themselves have free speech rights. Can you play that out a little bit and also talk about, you know, do any do their ability to exercise those rights and, and in, include or exclude people come with certain obligations as members of, of a pluralistic society and and really powerful platforms? So uh, that's an excellent question. And it's interesting to see sort of the partisan reversal that we've seen uh, to some degree among elites on these issues of corporate free speech rights. You know, if you go back to things like the Citizens United decision, uh, where the Supreme Court upheld the right of corporations to speak about political issues, uh, that was really decried on the left. And now we're seeing uh, people on the right being much more skeptical of corporate speech. So uh, in this case, from a from a First Amendment perspective, um, the companies like Twitter uh, or Facebook are really not that different from uh, any company that wants to put out speech, and they have a certain amount of editorial control that they can exercise over the speech that they want to put out. I mean, just like, you know, the 
the Economist has a point of view when it puts out information, and the New York Times has a point of view when it puts out information, and Twitter has a point of view when it puts out information. And the mere fact that they provide a platform for other people to express their views does not mean that they surrender their right to express their own views. Yeah, I mean, I think that the baseline First Amendment assumption is that everyone has a right to decide who gets to come into their dance hall, right? Like, if I own a stage, I get to decide who I invite on my stage. And if I am too narrow-minded and provincial in who I allow to come onto my stage, then people aren't going to come into my dance hall anymore, and they're not going to come listen to my speakers. And the, the baseline assumption, and again, these are not new issues, but the baseline assumption is that the, the market will sort this out, uh, that people who are too parochial uh, in what views they'll publish in their pamphlets won't find an audience for their pamphlets, uh, and that other people will publish new pamphlets, and that's where the, the readership will flock. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, the, you have criticism of these companies coming from the left as well, and they're saying the, the converse of, of the, the conservative concern, which is that these companies aren't restrictive enough. On NPR, the other day, I heard an academic saying, you know, maybe we shouldn't be looking at these companies as innovative startups anymore. We should be looking at them as something like an airline or a car company, which we require to think about safety. They have to put in seatbelts and airbags, and these companies similarly need to be more aggressive in policing the kind of speech on their platforms because it could be dangerous. Uh, what What is the response to that some, with that same sort of free speech paradigm? I mean, that is, it's also not a, a new argument. People have been calling ideas dangerous since the days of the Enlightenment. Uh, and ideas are dangerous. Lots of ideas are dangerous. Uh, and the, the fundamental insight of free speech is that there is a, a difference between forcing someone to put a seatbelt on a body and forcing someone to put a seatbelt on a word, uh, mostly because the, the lived experience of human history is that every time we have given powerful people the right to forcibly silence certain ideas, they have used that to their own advantage. They have used that to silence the politically weak. They have used that to silence unpopular views. Uh, and there kind of is no historical example of uh, a government of granting the government speech suppressing powers that has worked out well. The speech suppression has never stayed in its garden. It has always overgrown and it has always been used by the powerful against the less powerful for in order for the powerful to keep the themselves in power. That is just the history of speech regulation in, in civilization, not even just in this country. Yeah, this, this to me is one of the astonishing things about people who are calling for a present day revival and expansion of something like the fairness doctrine to cover speech that occurs on Twitter or Facebook. And it, it, it blows my mind that we're seeing people on the left making these arguments when, you know, until very, very recently, Donald Trump was the head of the executive branch of government, and surely they don't want, you know, Donald Trump or the next Donald Trump to be making the kinds of decisions about what is fair in terms of the presentation of views to the public. Um, so it's, it's an example, I think, of people having very, very short memories um, and not thinking through the implications of uh, their policy positions. To Go back again to the idea of safety. Um, the, I, I'm curious, Paul, to hear your reaction to the the comment that I, I hear a lot about the idea of yelling fire in the crowded theater, right? That speech can be dangerous if you're inciting violence. That was the, um, the thing that prompted Twitter to remove Trump's account ultimately back in January. They said, okay, it's too closely linked to physical violence. We think that this is, this is our, you know, our line. Um, how do you how do you look at that? How do you analyze that? Well, so so first, it it has to be said that I think every time a First Amendment lawyer hears anyone say the fire in a crowded theater line, uh, we we kind of roll our eyes because it's deployed as, essentially against any speech that anyone doesn't like. If if I don't like the speech, it's just like yelling fire in a crowded theater. Um, uh, incidentally, the line is not fire in a crowded theater; it's falsely yelling fire in a theater and causing a panic. Um, and another historical note, uh, the case that that comes from was about the distribution of anti-war literature. 
Um, that's what the Supreme Court said was just like yelling fire in a crowded theater. And so that's one of the reasons why we have to be really careful about what speech we say is harmful enough that the government can regulate it, because the government will use that power to suppress core political speech when it's in the government's interest. Uh, now, getting back to more central principles of incitement, at least as the Supreme Court has articulated it, incitement has a very narrow definition, and it's when you are inciting people to imminent lawless action. So this is not generalized advocacy of unlawfulness, or it's not even the, the propagation of potentially dangerous ideas like un, you know undermining the integrity of an election. This, this is genuinely working up a mob is kind of the classic example of incitement. Um, now, again, social media companies are not limited to exactly that line. They don't have to wait until you get all the way to legal incitement before they can decide, you know what, we just don't want our platform being used for this level of, you know, quote unquote, incitement as, as lay people use that term. So moving sort of from princ the, the principled uh, free speech approach, looking at it from free speech principles to more of a practical consideration, if if the idea is, you know, our, you know, Bob, you mentioned before, if the pamphlet is too provincial, people won't read it, they might choose another pamphlet that speaks to their interests. Um, and that very well may be what happened. It seems to be potentially what is happening a little bit in social media as people look for alternative platforms to Twitter or to Facebook um, for whatever reasons. Uh, are those, is that, is that necessarily a good consequence or is the idea that we should, you know, you, you, you get tired of hearing speech you don't like, but isn't it a good thing to hear speech you don't like? And isn't there some merit, practically speaking, to encouraging these companies, even if not, even if requiring them is dangerous and a bad idea to, to be more expansive as, as we look at sort of the, the, the idea of a public, a public square or a public sphere, I mean, I think there there are consequences, and there are certainly consequences just in terms of how we view our own personal lives and our own personal development in terms of what audiences you choose and what you choose to listen to. Uh, and this, again, goes back to Mill. I think we're doing ourselves a real disservice if we all retreat into increasingly tiny corners of the world where we only talk to people we agree with uh, who tell us that the things we believe are correct. You know, Mill says that it's not enough to believe true things. You have to understand why those things are true. And it's very hard to understand why those things are true uh, if you never hear the, the counter arguments to them, uh, both because you might change your mind and just because hearing a wrong counter argument helps you better understand your own beliefs. And so there is real social value in having a broader public square. And if we atomize into uh, a, an internet where all of us are living in our own corners, talking to the same 15 people who share our particular niche ideology, I think that's deeply unhealthy. Um, but I also think there's something to be said for, for what you might think of as diversity across institutions. Uh, it may well be that it's better for me to read a series of newspapers and engage with a series of different ideas so that I can believe correct things. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily follow that in every place I go, I have to be confronted with the same diversity of ideas. It's probably useful for me to go out in the world and you know, hear someone who thinks that, you know, what what I do is evil and the Constitution should be burned to the ground because it's a pact with the devil and I should be put to death. That is something that might be useful for me to hear uh, so I can, you know, interrogate my beliefs. But it also is probably not productive for me to invite that person to a dinner party at my house. Uh, I should still read the, the you know, Jacobinite newspaper that wants me put to death, perhaps, uh, without saying that the Jacobinite ideas have to have a seat at the table in every single venue. Uh, what I need to do as sort of a well-rounded, liberally-minded person is make sure I'm reading diverse sources and listening to diverse people, rather than necessarily guaranteeing that every single newspaper I might pick up is going to give me, you know, the perfectly spread smorgasbord of different ideas that the that a, a fairness doctrine might contemplate. So it's it's better to think about all of these outlets as outlets than a public square. 
I, I think the best way to think about it is that the the public square is maybe a little limiting, uh, as if we all live in one town that only has one public space and none of us is allowed to leave the town, right? Like we're all on the island in the prisoner. Uh, we've been assigned numbers and there's only one spot we can go to to hear speech. Um, that's not the world we live in. We actually have a lot of options of places where we can go to hear speech. Uh, and so I think when we're talking about the public square, we should be thinking about it as the public. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to focus on just one newspaper and say, is, is the New York Times giving me the full diversity of ideas that I need? It's probably not. The New York Times is giving me the set of ideas that the New York Times editorial board thinks I should see. Um, I should be looking elsewhere uh, rather than just saying the New York Times is the only thing I will ever read because it is the public square. The public square is the entirety of the public and you know it's, it's an area that continuously gets bigger and we should be trying to think about it as a whole rather than thin slice a little bit and say is this the public square is this the place that has to have the perfectly spread smorgasbord of ideas yeah i think that's right and i think we also have to have a certain amount of humility about our ability to project what the public square is going to be over time um, because certainly if you look back at what are the the you know three biggest media outlets where are most people getting their news uh, 10 years ago, that's going to be very different than where most people are getting their news today. And who knows where people are going to be getting their news 10 years from now or 20 years from now. So when people talk about uh, bringing in the government to to do more oversight, to do more regulation, one law that comes up a lot uh, is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Can you can one of you give a quick nutshell of a quick nutshell of what that is? and talk about whether or not we should repeal it, and why or why not. Sure. So Section 230 is a law that just says uh, the provider or user of an interactive computer service uh, can't be treated as the speaker or publisher of any content that's provided by a different content maker. And that sounds a little technical, but basically it's just about who can be sued for speech on the internet. Uh, there are lots of ways to sue people for things they say in this country. Probably the most prominent is defamation law. Uh, if I say Paul Sherman has a loathsome disease, Paul Sherman can sue me for defaming him if, in fact, he does not have a loathsome disease. Um, but the question emerged, and, you know, it's not a new question of who you can sue when I say something like that. You can sue me for saying it. Uh, if I write a letter to the editor and it's published in the newspaper, you can sue the newspaper. Can you sue the bookstore that sells that newspaper? And, you know, the general rule is I can be sued because I said it. The newspaper can be sued because they chose to publish it. The bookstore can't be sued because they're not the speaker. Uh, in the same sense, if someone writes a defamatory sentence on the side of my building, Paul can't sue me because I'm the speaker. Someone said it on my property, yes, but I didn't say it. Uh, I didn't publish that to the world. And so the question comes, how do you apply those principles to the internet? And, you know, people started suing internet service companies, and this was in the 90s, so we're talking about bulletin boards, Prodigy and CompuServe are being sued for things people posted. Uh, and generally speaking, those lawsuits were losing until an investment firm sued Prodigy in New York. And a New York trial judge said, hey, wait a minute, this isn't just something they scrawled on your wall. Prodigy exercises some, some content control. You have a profanity filter. And because you have a profanity filter, you can be held liable for letting somebody post this defamatory statement about this investment firm. There was a post on Prodigy that said this investment firm was defrauding its investors. And so the investment firm sued Prodigy. Uh, as a fun side note, uh, the investment firm was defrauding its investors. It was subsequently shut down by the SEC. And then Martin Scorsese made the movie Wolf of Wall Street about that same investment firm. Uh, so Wolf of Wall Street is secretly a movie about Section 230 of the Communications ECC Act. <laughs> um, but Section 230 is, base, is best viewed as a response, in large part, to that New York trial judge's ruling uh, that says, whoa, 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 the person who can be sued for content is the person who wrote the content. You can't just sue uh, an interactive computer service because somebody wrote something defamatory on it. You can't sue. You can sue me for writing a blog post that defames Paul Sherman, uh, but you can't sue me because someone writes a comment on my blog post that defames Paul Sherman. Uh, and it's a way of kind of limiting the liability for speech on the internet. Yeah, and and so this leads to I think a big time confusion about Section Two Thirty. Um, which is certainly propagated by some people who should know better. 
uh, which is that if you exercise any level of content moderation or if you put things like disclaimers uh, on speech, as Twitter started to do with claims about election fraud, that suddenly you are no longer a platform, you are a publisher, and you don't enjoy the protection of Section 230, when in fact Section 230 was designed to make sure that you could engage in that kind of moderation uh, without becoming a publisher for purposes of defamation law. So what would be the consequences of repealing Section 230? Like, let's say it was written to address these very things, but we don't want it to do that anymore. We want to be able to hold pe- these platforms uh, to a particular standard or accountable in a different way for the things that people are saying. Let's repeal it. What, what, what would change? Well, so in there, a way, it's there, not clear what would change, um, because before Section 230, courts were sort of figuring out these issues as a question of common law. They were saying, are you more like a newspaper or are you more like the bookstore? And most of the cases were saying, you're more like the bookstore. You're just providing, this is just something that's happening on your property. It's not something you're saying. And so there's every chance that if you repealed Section 230, uh, courts would continue moving in that direction. And they would continue saying that you can't be held liable for stuff other people write on your website. Um, because again, the, the court that went the other way was a trial court in New York. And my kind of my secret theory about Section 230 is that in New York, they call their trial courts the Supreme Court. And so what happened is the New York Supreme Court decided that Prodigy could be held liable. And it's just one trial judge, but it sounds like it's a really big deal. Um, but so what would happen is courts would go back to wrestling with that question. It might ha- work out that courts eventually come around to saying... Section 230 gets it right, and you're not liable. You are more like the bookstore. But what would happen in the short term is honestly a lot of uncertainty. Uh, Twitter can take the risk of saying, we bet a bunch of courts are going to, in a common law method, decide we won't be held liable. And so we're going to continue being Twitter. Uh, But if I'm just a guy with a blog... I'm just going to shut down my comment section. I'm not going to take the risk of litigation until everything's been settled out. And so it it might have no effect on the substantive law, but it would create a lot of uncertainty just repealing Section 230. And uncertainty of that kind, I think, almost always advantages larger businesses with bigger litigation budgets that can weather the uncertainty. So they would stick around and everyone else would leave the market. Yeah, and and the the danger of uncertainty is something that is considered throughout First Amendment law. It's a very common theme uh, because it it leads to what Bob is describing is called a chilling effect. People aren't sure where the line is, and so they stay very well clear of the line. And that's one of the reasons why the current Supreme Court, which has a very libertarian approach to First Amendment issues, has a strong preference for bright line rules where there's no ambiguity about whether something is protected or not protected. So we've we've talked through the free speech aspect of these debates. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, monopoly antitrust aspects. Uh, another common idea is that these companies are essentially monopolies and are subject or should be subject to antitrust regulations. Uh, would it be better for everybody if they if they were viewed that way and, and broken up? Yeah, so I, I think that is the the right frame with which to be talking about all of this. And again, what strikes me is that these aren't new debates, just as the, the idea that free speech can be dangerous isn't new and it's been around for centuries. The idea that someone's a monopoly is an idea that's been around for centuries. And I think thinking about monopolies gives us a, a useful tool, uh, a useful set of tools to think about how these companies actually work. Because once you start saying someone's a monopoly, you have to ask the immediate follow-up question, which is a monopoly of what, right? Like I have a monopoly over my living room. I'm the only one who can decide who can come into my living room. Uh, Twitter has a monopoly over Twitter. They're the only people who make the tweets. Um, But is that the relevant market? Uh, I have a monopoly on my living room, but I don't have a monopoly on all tastefully decorated spaces in the state in the state of Virginia. Uh, and Twitter has a monopoly on tweets, but does it have a monopoly over social media? Does it have a monopoly over news content, over any relevant market? And I think those are the useful questions that we want to be thinking about just at the threshold question of deciding whether something's a monopoly.
Yeah, there are also practical questions when you get into what would be the remedy if you consider uh, Twitter to be a monopoly. Um, you know, this is not a situation where it's like regional telephone companies and you can take a telephone monopoly and break it up uh, because no one's going to use like Twitter Southeast and, you know, Twitter, Twitter, you know, West and Twitter Northeast. Um, the very value of Twitter is that it is a worldwide network of people who can communicate with one another. Uh, so, you know, I agree with Bob that that monopoly is the framework for looking through this, um, but it raises uh, just as many questions as it answers. But I think it raises useful questions, and it, it they're questions that we're more used to answering. Uh, because once you determine that something is a monopoly, that doesn't end the conversation. It's always useful to think about why something is a monopoly and what might change to, to change the market to make it not a monopoly. You know, anytime I talk about monopolies, I always am called back to this argument I had with my roommate in college, who was just fervently of the mind that this particular business was a monopoly. It was dangerous. It had the entirety of the U.S. market share. Uh, no one could plausibly compete with it. And the only remedy was for the federal government to break it up. And on the facts, he was exactly right. The company he was talking about was a monopoly. It had something like 90 or 95 percent market share. Uh, and it was blockbuster. Uh, and looking at that debate in hindsight, you realize like, oh, blockbuster had a huge market share. But in fact, it, it was subject to disruption because the world changes. And so it's worth having, I think, a, a healthy dose of humility as we approach how to deal with things that seem in the moment to be monopolies, figuring out why they're monopolies, what might change to alter their monopoly status, and kind of be, be a little hesitant in swooping in just because something's big uh, and decide that because it's big, the only solution we have is sort of top-down regulation. And the, to that point about the size of these companies being one of the things that gives people so much pause, could you talk a little bit about the idea of, of viewing monopolies from that prism of bigness uh, versus what you know courts have been doing for the, the past few decades, which is consumer welfare, and how that might how that plays out in the case of maybe not so much Twitter because it is kind of its own separate thing, but something like Facebook or uh, Amazon, which is is sort of famously in legal circles the subject of this kind of discussion. Yeah. So so this is really a shift that happened in the last half of the twentieth century with the rise of law and economics, where antitrust law initially was focused on kind of this trust busting, you know, taking these large companies uh, and breaking them up because they were too big and too powerful. And what happened uh, in the last half of the 20th century, led by uh, thinkers like Judge Robert Bork, was this shift towards consumer welfare. And so looking at each example of alleged monopoly and saying, well, is the consumer being hurt by this or are they being benefited by this? And, you uh, from my perspective, in the case of social media, it's hard to show that consumers are being harmed by it uh, simply because it's free. Uh, people don't pay money to use Twitter and Facebook. So if Twitter and Facebook have a monopoly on their particular uh, speech distribution hubs, you know, well, so what? It's not costing the consumers on those services anything. Except that perhaps they get kicked off and they have nowhere to go. Is that, I mean, it, does that maybe make it a monopoly if you are somebody whose account is deleted, for instance? That, I mean, it was free. You're right. But it seems like losing it might be a harm if it's the way that you, I, I, I don't know, maybe it's just too philosophical, the kind of value that you get from being able to express your opinions and talk to your friends. Um does that does that matter at all, or is it completely a pricing question? Well, I, you know, I, I think it's, from a legal perspective, I think it's difficult for us to say what really matters. I mean, in part because the Sherman Antitrust Act is written so vaguely. No that, relation. <laughs> that yeah, it, it's yeah, no no relation. Um, but it but it is essentially essentially a type of federal common law um, that has evolved over time, and you know who knows how it will shift to take account of these different market actors, uh, you know that it's dealing with now that it didn't deal with fifty years ago. Um, so, you know, it's certainly a consideration that could go into it in terms of consumer welfare, but just in terms of, you know, normally when we think of the problem of monopoly, what we think of is, well, you have a monopoly, so you can charge monopoly rents, you can charge more money. 
and that's going to harm people who would otherwise pay lower prices. Uh, and at least for, you know, maybe that's true with regard to advertisers on Twitter, um, but at least with regard to the uh, the users on Twitter who are posting content, I, uh, you know, because they don't pay anything, I don't think they suffer that harm. Though it's worth noting that, and you know, I'm, I'm not kind of taking a position on either side of the debate, but there are debates in antitrust circles about what the, the purpose of antitrust law is. And, you know, Paul's correct that the Sherman Antitrust Act is the, one of the vaguest commands Congress has ever given the courts. And, you know, the, the modern prevalent view is that it's about consumer welfare and it's about uh, prices. Uh, but there is another view, which is that bigness in and of itself is a problem. Uh, that the the mere existence of gigantic corporations is uh, a danger to to the society. They become too influential. They become too powerful, and they should be broken up uh, by by dint of their sheer bigness. Uh, that's a view that has been largely abandoned by the courts. It's been abandoned by the Department of Justice. Uh, but it's a view that I I really start to hear echoed in a lot of the discussion of tech, and I hear it frankly from people who I I don't think actually subscribe to that view on a broader basis, which is one of the reasons why I think it's useful to talk about this as a monopoly problem, uh, that we should be talking about this through the lens of how we deal with business, how we deal with big business, not specifically how we deal with big business that happens to involve tweets. Um, because I, I think we should probably have a, a consistent and coherent theory of what antitrust law is for and what we're using it for and apply it in an even-handed way. And a lot of the kind of antitrust-sounding arguments in this field, uh, I think would be, it would be useful for both sides to just plug them in to the, the broader debate people have been having about the function of antitrust law. So setting aside the idea of breaking up these companies, um, but still looking at the, the they, they're serving a lot of people. They're, they're very big. They ha we're asking them to do a lot or they're offering to do a lot. Um, one idea that was floated in the Wall Street Journal not too long ago by Richard Epstein, a really well-known scholar of property rights and, and law, was to the idea of looking at them as a common carrier, perhaps something like a railroad that has to take people uh, take their business regardless of their political views, and maybe that that by by approaching these companies from from that paradigm, we might be able to kind of untangle some of what you know what people are worried about in terms of viewpoint discrimination or 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 something like that. So I think that's what Richard's doing there is exactly the the kind of useful move that I think needs to happen in this debate, which is situating it in the debate about antitrust law and about monopolies. Like the, the reason for common carrier regulation, at least traditionally, was to, to as a way of regulating technical monopolies. Uh, like if, if you build a railroad, no one's going to go lay parallel railroad tracks right next to your railroad and compete with you on that route. Like once you've built the railroad, the sunk costs of your investment will on their own, the theory goes, keep other people from building a railroad. And that, some people would say, makes you a monopoly. Set aside, you know, personal cars and buses and whether you're really a monopoly, people say that makes you a monopoly and there are a few things you can do with a monopoly. Uh, you can have the government take it over and run it directly. You can ignore it and hope that it's eventually disrupted like Blockbuster. Or you can regulate it by, for example, making it a common carrier and say, we're going to regulate the prices you can charge. We're going to regulate how you sell your tickets and who you're allowed to refuse service to. Um, and that is kind of the the middle path. Now, the danger in taking that path uh, is, as Milton Friedman was fond of pointing out, uh, the, the world may change in a way that makes the monopoly go away, but nothing is going to make the railroad commission go away. So once you decide to have a railroad commission, you're going to have a railroad commission forever. Uh, even if the rest of the world is now traveling on jetpacks, your railroad commission is just going to hang around. And that's it, it's a danger in taking that approach. Um, but it also uh, folds us into the question of, whether they're a monopoly in the first place. You know, is Twitter a monopoly? Is it a railroad? Is it impossible to build another Twitter? And if so, why is it impossible to build another Twitter? And those, I think, are the, the useful questions that we have to ask before we jump to sort of the question of what we do about the monopoly, which is where things like common carrier regulation become options you can discuss, if not options you always want to choose. Yeah, and, and I think the Richard's point also helps focus on, 
which is the monopoly that we really care about. You know, maybe Twitter has a monopoly right now on tweets, um, but maybe the monopoly we actually care about is if Amazon has an effective monopoly on web hosting services. Um, I think if it's impossible to put up something that competes with Twitter, um, you know, a, a service like Parler, you know, which obviously was in the news. Uh, I, I think that gets to some really interesting and difficult questions about whether the web hosting service uh, is itself a monopoly and should be subject to kind of common carrier rules, which I, I'm, I'm kind of stepping outside my lane as a First Amendment lawyer here. But this, t- this touches on a lot of the debate about net neutrality. Um, and this is one of the reasons why people care about that issue. So um, we've been beating up a little bit on the companies uh, to to look at things a little bit from their perspective. Um, if you, they have built they've they've built this up, they've built the consumer base. They put pr- potentially a, a ton of investment into infrastructure. Um, what about maybe a property rights consideration, like the idea that this is something that they own and that that it deserves some sort of you know, if not ultimate deference, you know, some sort of consideration. How how do you, as attorneys who know something about property rights, look at that in in their case? Well, you know, th- this to me is is another interesting example of how uh, kind of the political views on these issues have shifted. Um, because one of the things that you're seeing is uh, conservatives approvingly citing this Supreme Court decision, Prune Yard versus Robin Shopping Center, uh, which was a, a case about. Uh, it was from California. California has a free speech protection that purports to be broader than that provided by the First Amendment. And they said that if you own a shopping center, you have to allow people to pick it at your shopping center. You can't exclude them. And the Supreme Court said that that is, that's fine. It doesn't violate the First Amendment. It doesn't violate the takings clause. And Typically, conservatives have not liked that view. It's very intrusive on the property rights because the right to exclude is maybe the most fundamental of property rights. Uh, And yet now we see people citing Pruneyard and saying, oh, you know, just like it was impossible to get your view out if you couldn't be at the food court in the shopping mall, now it's impossible to get your view out if you can't be on Twitter. Uh, You know, the thing is that when we look back at, at the reasoning of Pruneyard and how the shopping mall was the new public square in the year 2021, it sounds utterly ridiculous. And, you know, we have to have some humility and think that maybe our views about, you know, what's the only way you can get your view out uh, today are going to sound kind of silly in 2041. So these are all such new technologies. We're dealing with them now in a unique environment. You know, as you suggested, humility is really important. Um, as as the the as they evolve and new aspects of them come up, how do you personally think about these issues? What is the what are there general principles that you keep in mind as you look at uh, the way that the the government should be enlisted in you know ensuring that companies do sort of the right thing on, in, in a social way? I mean, for me, the the touchstone is always trying to have, as Paul says, a sense of humility and a sense of respect for the the dynamic nature of human society. Uh, that I think there's a tendency to say that the way things are now is the way things are always going to be. And therefore, our only option is to turn to government for regulation. Uh, when, in fact, I think people do respond, like ultimately, uh, what tech companies are trying to do is get as many users as possible under their umbrella so that they can make as much money as possible. Uh, And that means they're not going to make decisions that make a whole bunch of people extremely angry because those people are going to use other services, provided it's, you know, physically possible to start other services. Um, That I think the the Pruneyard example is perfect because just as it's hilarious to say that the only way to get my message across is to pamphlet at a shopping mall, uh, it may well be hilarious in 20 years to say that the only way to get my message across is to tweet. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if kids today use the Twitter. Uh, I don't know what they will be using in the future. And it's worth always having a, a sense of always constantly reminding myself, because it is a hard thing to keep in mind, that the world is going to look very, very different in six months, and that government moves slowly. 
Uh, and so any governmental regulatory scheme has to take into account the fact that it's going to be designed for today's world and it will be implemented in the world of five years from now. Uh, and that should always, always make us move with caution. Well, thank you both for talking through all of these ideas. And thank you to everyone listening for joining us for today's deep dive. If you enjoyed this episode, you can get more wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.